I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Genesis, beginnings. In Genesis chapter 1, we'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 24. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 24, I'm dealing with the subject of the return to biblical manhood. The return to biblical manhood. Quite frankly, there are untold millions of people all around the world who believe that is an impossibility. We have moved so far away from the idea of biblical manhood, we will never get back there. Never. I don't believe that's true. I believe God is moving and working in the lives of his people and we will have a return to biblical manhood. We must have it. So much depends upon it. Think of all the things that are broken down because biblical manhood has been disappearing from the face of the earth. Think of it. So many enemies against biblical manhood. All the forces of this world, this world system, uh, the untold toll that feminism has had. I'm all for women and women's rights. I was raised by a woman. My mother raised four children basically by herself. So I'm all for everything you can do for women. Everything you can actually help them to do. Everything you can do to give them the opportunity to do. My mother had to work many long hours. All the kind of things that, that I learned to appreciate it deeply. So I'm, I'm all for that. But I'm talking about the movement of feminism. And the disruption of manhood. And the things that have created such an undercurrent about God's design. In that matter, it's even difficult for ministers to talk about it because people sort of flinch and shudder to think, we're going to talk about something that might be anti-women? Nothing like that. Nothing anti-women. But we're dealing with this, this movement and the repercussions of this movement now in full bloom all across our land and around the world. There are many things. Of course, we're dealing with the sin nature always. And the sin nature is always moving away from God and God's design. That's why we begin here in Genesis chapter 1 with God's design. Is there such a thing as biblical manhood? Is there a, a mantle for manhood? Is there? If you're willing to admit yes there is, then what is it? And how can we return to biblical manhood? Just a few weeks, we have a big rally with hundreds and hundreds, eight thousands of men coming. God bless them. Fine speaker, all of that. But it's not about a meeting. It's not about some rally we're having. We're trying to encourage them a movement back to biblical manhood, a return to biblical manhood. Now, I want us to look at the beginning, the beginning of manhood here. And what we must return to. I'd advise you to take some notes. Write down verse of scripture. Get the idea. Pass it along to others. In this new year, every Sunday in the church bulletin, we're going to give you an opportunity to find a place where you could promote passing on what you've heard. Every service, at the end of the service, we're going to do this. Now, text somebody. Send this out some way. And we're going to work at that and see what God's people will do with it. Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat and so it was. And God saw everything that he had made and said, behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I believe in the six days of creation, just like the Bible states. I trust you have the faith to believe God for that. But I want you, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, to mark this expression in verse 27 of chapter one in the book of Genesis. Male and female created he them. There's a difference between a male and a female. Now notice as we just read this passage that man was a created being, created in God's image. Again, we read and God said in verse 26, let us make man in our image. What does that mean? We're not like plants. We're not like animals. We're made in God's image. You find a plant, you look at a plant, a plant has life, but it does not, does not have a soul, it does not have a spirit, but it has life. God made plants, he made every living thing. You find an animal, an animal has life, it has body, it has soul, but it does not have spirit. But we've been made in God's image if you'll hold your place here just for a moment and turn with me in the New Testament, you may want to write this passage near the passage there in the book of Genesis in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And the Bible says in verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have spirit, soul, and body. In our spirit, when we're born again, that's where the Lord lives. We are alive in him. In our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. In our body, we have these wonderful senses God has designed, these gates that we have to receive things. And so we are spirit, soul, and body. We are this trichotomy of being. We are not just Body, we're not just body and soul. We're not body like a plant or body and soul like an animal. We're different from all God's creation. We have body, soul, and spirit. We're made in God's image. This is God's design. We were created. We were created to be co-laborers with the Lord. We're laborers together with God, the Bible says, and Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And so this is God's design in the beginning of God's design for manhood. This is what we find. Notice carefully, the Bible goes on to tell us not only that, but he made us stewards over his possessions. And the word of God says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so God designed us to be stewards of his creation. This is amazing. This is in God's original intent for mankind. This is what we find in manhood when he made us. Again, male and female, do you have that marked? May God help us. And he also designed that we be called to account. This is the thing that people don't want today. Even so many Christian people with whom I speak don't want to accept accountability. But if you read on in the book of Genesis chapter three, remember when man sinned against God, God came and called him into account. And the Bible says, 
in chapter 3 of Genesis, in verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? You are accountable to God, your creator. Where are you? So, in summary, he tells us that we are created by the hand of God. Created to be laborers together with God. Stewards over God's possession. Think of that. What a high holy calling to labor together with God over his possessions. Think of that. And then called into account. Let me just read this to you if you'll turn with me to the book of Romans just for a moment. In Romans chapter 14, you ought to mark these verses, verses 10, 11, and 12. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11 of Romans chapter 14. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's in God's original design of manhood. And everything we find in God's original design, the forces of this world, the educational system that has turned against God, not all education, but the system that's turned against God, the world system, the pull of all of it is against what God has designed in the original intention of manhood, denying creation, denying that we're co-laborers with God, we're just in it for ourselves. Make it to the top of the mountain. Be the best and biggest you can be. Think of that. Oh, may God guide us and help us. May God give us understanding. Stewards over his possessions. It's ours, not God's. No, it's not ours, it's God's. And God has given us all these things in our hand, even the very air we breathe, the water we drink, everything we have. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So far we've gone. And then to be called into account. This is, this is the time in human history when everybody blames everybody else for what's wrong with them. If it wasn't for you, I'd be a happy person. If it wasn't for you, I'd be the right kind of person. If it wasn't for you, my life would be all right. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it was God's intent that every man accept the fact that we are personally accountable to God. Now, that's what we find in God's original intent. How do we get back there? How do we make the journey back there? For the person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been redeemed. Not just redeemed from our sin and sin debt, but redeemed back to God. Brought back to God. Rescued back to God. So if there's going to be a return of biblical manhood, it must involve certain things. I'd like for you to write them down if you would, please. Number one, we must embody the word of God. In the sense that Christ lives in us, we do embody the word of God. He is the word, the living word of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. He lives in us. We are new creatures and new creations. He takes us back to himself for our children. What do you want your daughter to marry? What do you want your son to be? What do you want, we want our children to be? What do you want to be as a man? I'm saying we're putting this great emphasis and lots of labor and intensity in the whole idea of a men's meeting and bringing men here. What are we going to say to them? We need to return to biblical manhood. And it must begin with embodying the word of God. Embodying it. Internalizing God's word. And so many professing Christians are satisfied to say, well, I've been saved. 
And you and I can make professions of faith and say we've been saved, we've asked God to forgive our sin and by faith trusted Christ as Savior, but never allow the Lord to make the difference in our life he desires to make. It's not what we want, it's what God wants. We have to stop talking about our desires and begin to look at what God desires of us. And then our desires ought to be transformed to his desires and we want from God what God wants for us. I want you to write this verse down. Would you please? Let's go to the Psalms just for a moment. The great rescue has taken place. God has sent his only begotten son. He came into the world, lived a sinless life, died for our sins on Calvary, became sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God to redeem us back to God. That's what he's done. And so where must we begin to have the return of biblical manhood? And you know people make lists, all kinds of lists about what they'd like to see a man do, or be, or see a man be. But you know when we embody God's word, it takes care of all of that. When we become servants of the word of God and servants of the Lord and determine that we're going to live under his ruling presence, it settles all those other questions. God help us. If you've been lost in list of some kind, you're lost in the wrong place. Psalm 119, just one verse here. I want you to get it, please. The psalmist writes in verse 80 of this wonderful 119th Psalm. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed. What a powerful statement. It is the word of God. Verse 80 of Psalm 119. Let my heart be sound in thy statute. Sound in thy statutes. That's the word of God. In other words, let every empty place, every vacancy, every weakness, everything be built up in God's word. Make me complete in Jesus Christ and his word. Get an appetite for the word of God. Get the word of God in your life. I must get it in my life. Remember now, spirit, soul, and body. Remember, we are spiritual people now if we've been born again. And with this new birth needs to be the return to biblical manhood. And it must begin with embodying the word of God. Again, the verse, let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed. And every person who is not sound in the word of God will be ashamed. Everything I have done that I'm ashamed of is because I did not let God's word rule in my life. I did not follow the specifics of God's word. I went off the path. I disobeyed God. I challenged God's authority in my life. I thought I had a better idea than God had. You see, we've, we've gone crazy, literally crazy. The world has gone crazy and we're living in a crazy world. We've thrown away God's rules, thrown away God's intent and we've made our own rules for the game. Our own rules. But what we want, what we expect of people, that's all wrong. There must be a return to biblical manhood. And it begins with the embodiment of God's word. Hiding God's word in our heart. Making our heart strong with the statutes of God's word. Are we going to continue to be so ashamed of our actions and our behavior? Would you go with me again in the New Testament as we think about this very thing to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 16, without, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We must spend some time meditating on this subject, the mystery of godliness. Do you have that before you there? Are you looking at it? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to see this expression, the mystery of godliness. Mark that well in your Bible. 
the mystery of godliness. What is the mystery of godliness? This mystery is something only God by his spirit can reveal to us, the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. Here, God was manifest in the flesh. Who is this baby? Born of Mary. Who is this baby? This is God manifest in the flesh. Who is the virgin born son? This is God manifest in the flesh. Not only manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. Have you believed on him? Received up into glory. These are not abstract things we just say about Jesus Christ. He is God. Again, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. It's God who lives in us to transform our lives. Does he have any ideas when he comes to live in us? Certainly. He says, I did it right the first time. Before man sinned against God, my intent is what I'm taking you back to. And so we must embody the truth of God, embody the word of God. This is where it all begins. The second thing, if we're going to have a return to biblical manhood, is we must, we must live in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now this involves death to self. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lived in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. You see, it's not just trying to do better now. Well, I became a Christian, I'm trying to live better. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no, no. It's not better. It's not even better than someone else. It's totally different. It's on another level. It's, it's another world. You say, you strange. That's strange stuff. No, no, no. That's Bible talk. It's Bible talk. And so we are now to live in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Before Adam sinned against God and after Adam sinned against God, he noticed distinct differences. Before sin, he walked with the Lord. He talked with the Lord. He fellowshiped with God. He had companionship with God. There was nothing between him and God. Before sin came in, he was strengthened. God said, I'm going to bless you. If you look again in the book of Genesis, when God said, I'm going to bless you, just look clearly what he says. He says in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1, and God blessed them and God said unto them. How did God bless them? He talked to them. That's how he blessed them. He instructed them. How could they do all these things God gave them to do? God gave them the power to do it, walking with him, laboring together with him. Now when God brings us back to himself, in order for us to know what biblical manhood is, we have to be embodied with the word of God, strong in the statutes of God, and now begin to live in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Our response to people, not the same. Our goals for our lives, not the same. Our desires for others, not the same. Not if we've returned to biblical manhood. See, we've got this so-called Christian idea that's not a Christian idea at all that we're trying to make somebody who's a, a professing Christian a little better than, a little, a little brighter than, a little more hopeful than, whatever, than somebody who's not a Christian. Matter of fact, we even... We even enroll them in a Christian school or we bring them to a Christian college and we think it's like something we work on like a paint and body shop. When we finish with them, uh, something, something automatically changes in their life. No, it doesn't. There's no guarantee a life is transformed in a school room. There's an opportunity. If we have the right thing being taught and the witness of the Holy Spirit, it's not a guarantee it's only an opportunity to respond to it properly and have one's life changed. I've heard parents for, 
how long? Decades. Say, I put my kid through that school and there's no difference in their life now than those who didn't go. Sorry. We didn't paint on the outside of the building. Guaranteed to be a super Christian. We just enroll them. There are no guarantees. There's no guarantees in coming to church. Men, the wickedest, most wicked people you know on the face of God's earth, if you'll check their pedigree, they have spent time in church somewhere. I read today an article in an old issue of Reader's Digest about a man who was a serial killer, who was a deacon in a church who killed children and women. Well, he was going on fishing trips and things with his daughter. As a matter of fact, he became famous as a famous serial killer. And the whole time, he was going to church. But something, there was something he wasn't getting. So he said, I'm going to plant them in church and drag them to church and get them to church. And I can get them to church, it's going to be all right. No, 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 that doesn't make them all right. It doesn't make anybody all right. They should be there to hear the truth of God's word but it's not going to be effective in anyone's life unless it's received and embodied and acted upon. And so I'm interested in biblical manhood and a return to biblical manhood. Men who will depend on the spirit of God, who will beg God for mercy and grace, who will pray to God and ask God for wisdom and ask God to help them be the men and the fathers and the husbands and the leaders they ought to be. That's what we got to have, not just get people in church and all these kind of training sessions. They've got to get hold of God and get God, let God get hold of them to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you a verse of scripture. The Bible says, if you turn with me to what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, what did that produce? We always preach on that verse or teach on that verse like it produced lots of outward things. So, Paul, we applaud you. <laughs> Wonderful. You determined not to know anything among them but Jesus Christ and crucified. So, he told everybody about Jesus Christ and crucified. But what did it do for Paul? What happened internally to Paul when his dependence was entirely upon God and not his ability, not his education, not his knowledge, not his winsomeness? What happened internally to Paul? What happens internally to you? You know, you, you can have a revolution in your home, in your heart, in your family, and never be the same if you determine to become a biblical man and return to biblical manhood. Here's what happened. The Bible says in verse 3, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That's a part of it, dying to self. Dying is not an easy thing. Coming to a place of helplessness is not an easy thing. We want to blow up and show how much, you know, ability we have. And I see it on parade every day, and you do too. It's on parade all over the world. The whole world system just blowing about what they can do. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You see, we, we actually have people giving lectures today to young ministers about what power words to use. How they can sway people with certain speech. It's being taught in some colleges. 
I remember going to a, a great lecture hall. I was to bring the keynote address and there were 3,000 plus people there who were all educators. And before I was to speak, I listened to a man in a session who was speaking and he spoke on power words. These are the power words. And he gave a list of power words that preachers and teachers should use. If you'll use these power words, you can get powerful things done. I literally got so sick that I got physically sick and had to go outside the meeting and ask God to help me. I was about to throw up. I changed my message. I spoke on a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. But here he said, and my speech in my preaching, by the way, the man who gave that power word lecture, pastor of a big church, is no longer in the ministry. I'm not happy that he's no longer in the ministry unless perhaps he ought to be out of the ministry if he's teaching people that's the way the ministry ought to be. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And may I say quickly on the heels of that, my greatest failure sometimes it's when I walk across away from this pulpit and go back to my seat, find my way to my car and know that I could have had God's greater blessing on my life. I could have had God's spirit power on the message. But no, I was content to be a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I made lots of noise. But Paul said, that's not, that's not it. He said, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And listen, beloved, the most popular preacher in America is Joel Osteen. And he's the poster boy for this. I even have people give me books and say, if you'll just do what Joel Osteen does, perhaps you'll have the crowds Joel Osteen has. Joel Osteen says an Islamic person is just as comfortable in my service as a person who's a Christian. You know how that happens? You don't deal with the exclusivity of Christ in salvation. That's how that happens. You don't say there's a real hell. You don't say, you don't say the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. You can't get there without him. You don't say that. Now, you know, we've got work to do. We've got work on our hands. We've got work to do. I've got work to do in my own heart and let God do in my heart. And I'm not going to get it done going around about talking about everybody who's not getting it done. I just need to let God do it in my own life. We have a return to biblical manhood. It will be because of the embodiment of the word of God and a determination that we're going to live in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Waiting on God, praying, trusting God, believing God, knowing that it's an answer to prayer. And this is it. And by the way, seasons of prayer, earnest praying, toiling in prayer, struggling through prayer, breaking through to God, spiritual power. That's what we must have. Are we going to continue to fill the land with imitation Christians who've been spit, shine, and polished and have all the answers, the cute answers that people hear but don't have the Lord's power in their lives. By the way, you know what that power brings? Let me show you. If you turn the book of Galatians chapter 5 just for a moment. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22 is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Notice this fruit is singular. It doesn't say fruits, but it lists nine things. Three of these things are inward, three of them are Godward, and three of them are manward. In other words, every part of our existence is changed by the Holy Spirit. 
inward, Godward, manward, it's all changed by the Holy Spirit. And when I recognize that I do not have this fruit, love, joy, peace, when I recognize I don't have that, when I recognize I don't have long suffering and gentleness and goodness, when I don't have those things internally, love, joy, and peace, when I don't have those toward men, long long suffering with people and gentleness and goodness. When I notice these things missing Godward, faith, meekness, temperance, then I know the problem. The problem is the Holy Spirit doesn't have his way in my life. I haven't died to self. I just learned how to do it without God. And most people learn how to do it without God. Let me ask you a question. Do you really want to see a return to biblical manhood? I guess we ought to ask first, is there such a thing as biblical manhood? I believe in the Bible we find that there is such a thing as biblical manhood. That's the way God created man. That was God's intent. Well then, if God really did create biblical manhood and we want to see a return to biblical manhood, then are we willing to allow God to bring about that return first in our own lives? We must embody the word of God. We must live in the power of the spirit of God. And a third thing and I'll do this quickly, is we must grow in the spirit as a spiritual person. This progress, this wonderful passage that God continues to use to speak to me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Beginning with verse 11, the Bible says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. <laughs> I revert to that too often. But when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. You couldn't reason with a child, give them long range. You know, look here, buckle down, buddy. You got to buckle down, you know. Work hard. You're in the first grade. Now learn your ABCs. It's going to provide a great foundation for you for college and you'll grow up and have a great college degree and get a good job someday, great paying job. Now listen, son, I know you're only six years old. Children don't understand that. They don't understand that. I admire teachers who can motivate them. I, I was motivated by teachers and people. A little different motivation. I thank God for the third grade teacher who found out I was dyslexic. Had a slight case of it, not, not a real heavy case of it. And taught me how I could learn that I wasn't stupid. That teacher, Miss Burns, made a contribution to my life and unlocked some things for me that I have been the blessed beneficiary of all of my life. But children behave a certain way. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. I remember when my parents divorced, I, I thought, I'm the only child in Blunt County who's going through this. That's the way I thought. Nobody else is having this happen but me. I was just all bound up in what I thought about what was going on. It's all about me. So... But when I became a man, I wish we could just check, like we check our pulse and see, check, check please. Check up, is manhood coming on you? I wish we could look in the mirror. When my grandkids are there said, I'm gonna to have to start shaving. I thought, oh, oh. Is that the way we determine if you're becoming a man? You know? How do we give this manhood check? I don't 
speak anymore like a child. I don't understand anymore just the way a child understands. I don't think just the way a child thinks. Because when I became a man, I put away. And by the way, some of you Greek teachers can help me. You have to keep putting away and putting away and putting away and putting away and putting away. You have to be reminded some things have to be put away. That's why God gives this miracle of forgiveness and this miracle of mercy and enablement. So we don't have to continue to make terrible mistakes and be ashamed because we didn't get filled with the statutes. So I put away childish things. Biblical manhood. If you, if you can just stop there, that's fine. If you can just pray for me that I'll be, I'll be an example and a recipient of biblical manhood. But we've got so many other people to help and we can't help any of them unless we get help ourselves. The return of biblical manhood. Let's pray, may we?